Welcome everyone to the May ACHSM webcast series. Um, our monthly webcasts um, feature leading academics and professionals from the health and leadership sector and they're here to share their experience and their expertise on a wide range of industry topics. Today we are delighted that we have David Pension um, on our webcast um, to hear his experiences. He was the founder and director of Sustainable Development Unit for NHS England and Public Health England. He's also, as you'll see in his bio, a visiting professor at Exeter University and we are glad he's able to join us today because he's also a guest of Sydney University. If you look below me on the timeline, you'll see that there's a little speech bubble and one of the things that's quite important for us through the webcast is that we can collect and gather your questions. And so if you just press the bubble, fill out the form, send it in, we would like to also have your names and email addresses. And what's really helpful for David and I is if you can share your questions as we are talking because often um, what we're interested in is the question that the conversation has aroused in you and we'll come back to those at the end of the session. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to David and um, invite, us, invite him to share with us his experiences of sustainable development. Welcome David. Thank you very much and welcome to all of you online. Um, so I thought what I would do just for a few minutes while you're thinking of those questions, and they are really important because it'll, it'll make it much more real and much more practical and much more useful for us all if you have some you know, good, penetrating, challenging questions. I was just going to give a little overview of um, our journey in England and, and specifically within the NHS, uh, just to give you some context. Because it is rather an, an odd subject, actually, but the more I hope I'll share with you the story, the more you'll see how it's relevant to us as health professionals, as managers, as government people, as clinicians, um, as we go on. Anyway, so what happened was 10 years ago, we had some quite pioneering legislation in, in England called the Climate Change Act. Um, which was a piece of legislation which applied to all parts of civic society, public sector, private sector, and it essentially set targets for 2050 um, in order to make sure that we uh, collectively move steadily and swiftly and in an evidence-based way towards a safe, secu secure future. Now, you might think, what has this got to do with the health service? Well, it had a quite a lot to do with the health service because we, and I wasn't the unit that I directed for the last 10 years, wasn't established at that time, a number of us said, look, this is very relevant to the health sector, um, not because uh, there's a lot necessary for us to do that's special, but be, and this is the key issue that I've learned over the past 10 years, is that in these moments where there's something for everybody to do, the health, the health service cannot stand aside and say, we are too busy running our hospitals, seeing our patients. So the Department of Health, the NHS, in a very enlightened way, set up a small unit, which I've been directing uh, for the past 10 years, and I've just set, um, stepped down. What we did was we underwent a whole lot of interventions. We, we, we changed the health service in lots of different, subtle, small, mostly non-threatening ways that did something quite important, which was to send out a message to patients, to staff, to the public, to politicians, to policymakers, and even to business, that actually the health service is taking this issue of our time, namely climate change or sustainable development, whichever way um, we'd like to talk about it, we are taking it seriously. And I just want to mention a couple of things that might be relevant to you. Um, where we, I'll, I'll focus on the successes, I'll be very biased here, we had lots of failures, but I'll focus on the successes just to make it a positive experience for us on this <laughs> webcast. So the first thing we did, which I really, I'm so glad we did, and it wasn't my idea, was to consult widely with staff in the health system. So there were a lot of people around me as directors of the health service who said, well, doctors and managers and nurses, they're way too busy to get interested or involved or actually doing things. So our, we've got a core job to do of treating people as they come through the front door. So we went out to consultation with 1.3 million people um, and we had the largest non-statutory response to any government consultation ever and the, the result was, was numerous. One was we got a huge response in terms of numbers, both organisational and individual. Secondly, we got a whole lot of really great ideas about what could be done. And so that was great. I and mean, that was a learning for me in terms of management, is listen, listen, listen. Uh, but thirdly, the act of establishing the unit and doing a consultation permissioned people, allowed people, gave people confidence to talk about the great things they were doing, whether they were talking about patient pathways or prevention or food systems in hospitals or car parking or whatever it was. It, it, it allowed people to get up and sit up and speak up to say, actually, this is core to our business, which is health. So one of the things we didn't know was that many hospitals in their annual reports were already putting in things such as, here's our financial statement, but here is our statement about our commitment to the future, to the environment, to the community health, down to even things like, these are the number of business miles we fund and the, number, the amount of air quality we're responsible in this hospital for uh, reducing, which is very interesting. So we, the, 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 the consultation process for us as trying to manage this was it gave us great legitimacy to talk to politicians and ministers to say, yeah, 1.3 million people, the largest workforce in England, on the evidence we've uh, gathered, is up for doing something. 
And the next issue was, so what are you up for doing? What, what is legitimately within the... Uh, so the first thing was actually not clinicians getting on their soapboxes, useful that, that, though that is sometimes. It was governance managers and finance managers factoring these other issues into the governance processes. So I, as an ex-clinician, was absolutely staggered by how much finance managers, chief execs, governance managers, directors of you know, patient consultation, they were up for incorporating this sensibly into their jobs. Um, and the, I guess one of the most important things that we were lucky enough to be able to do is to turn voluntary reporting into mandatory reporting. And we didn't do that really until voluntary reporting of all 350 hospitals had got over about 50%. And the lesson for me was that once you can show that this is normal, this is over 50%, it's much easier to say, well, we probably need a bit of regulation here to, to make it expected, and then mandatory. And then now we as a central national unit report on how many hospitals are reporting well on it. And we give prizes and awards and people celebrate. They celebrate the success they're making in these areas of looking at not just financial sustainability, but economic sustainability and how their, for instance, their hospital creates better jobs for local people by their actions. And I'm very happy to tell some wonderful stories that I, I've been privileged to witness, but also in terms of environmental sustainability, so that um, we as a health system cannot be accused of doing more harm to those conditions that create health than, than we, we can possibly get away with. So I'll just finish there, but I'll, the, the last point before we sort of open it up to questions, and there's a lot more detail behind all of that, um, is that one of the most important things I've learned is to stop framing climate change as an environmental issue and start framing it as a health issue. And that makes much more sense. And there have been some quite revolutionary ch framings of this issue, every, all the way from local hospitals and health centres, all the way up to the United Nations process or air quality regulation at a national level, by the reframing of the issue in terms of patient health or public health or worker health or staff health um, or community health. So that's the issue, that's the business we're all in, which is health. So we might as well play that card as well as we can in terms of looking at climate change as a, an immediate health issue now, both risk and opportunity actually, rather than a distant existential risk for the environment many years away. And that's a, that's a disastrous way to frame it because nothing's gonna happen personally or politically if we do that. So I'll stop there and then maybe we'll, we'll catch a few questions. Thank you, David. Um, perhaps I can start by asking you a couple of questions that came up for me just listening to what you were saying. So, the, the impetus behind that initial consultation seems to have created a lot of energy mm. across the mm. system. Mm. And, and I suppose the question after you get that kind of feedback is, um, you've got a lot of will in the mm. system to try mm. and do something. Mm. How did you then think through with um, the system how to make it easy for people to make it part of their everyday yeah. job? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good question, partly because uh, in this area, a lot of people will always say, I feel very strongly about this, I care about this. But when you say, so what are you doing? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more threatening. So you know, in my more provocative moments, I say caring strongly about this is not enough. So to, just to play to your question, the way we addressed that was that when people would say, I care about the number of business miles that health service staff travel, for instance, and we calculated that one in 20 vehicles on the road in England are on health service business. And it will be mm. probably be similar here, and maybe even more here, actually, because yeah. you, you, you're a more spread out country. What we did was we sifted out those people who said, I care about this, and that's very useful. So those people who said, I care about this, and this is what we've done in our local hospital. And even if it wasn't very much, we were very positive about what they've done. And when we ca caught people doing really great things, and believe me, really great things were happening anyway, way before the unit was established, we would build them into case studies and we would invite them to would help them because it's, when, you're, when, you're, when you're innovating, it's a big ask to write about your innovation at the same time because you're normally too busy doing it. So we would send out a comms person to go and capture their story and quantify it and look at the multiple benefits like the money it saved or the, the communities it got engaged or the local jobs it created or the reputation it enhanced for the hospital. And we crafted it into a case study that was written, and this, this is down to the, the, the intelligence of our comms colleagues, uh, written in such a way that enabled other people to do it, not shamed other people or made it look so difficult that they were going to back off, but made it a very humble, enabling story of not only what had been done in this hospital, but most importantly, how, you could f how it was framed to the board or to the patients or to fellow clinicians or to finance managers such that it tapped into a positive energy to improve not the sort of, haven't we got enough to do already? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm too busy saving you know, patients to save the planet or whatever it was, you know, very creative excuses would come back. But so case studies, really great case studies, which are human stories, mm -hmm. where you can look at the money saving, the health enhancement and the environmental protection all in one. Okay, that's, um, I think the whole notion of sharing a case study is a great mm. kind of platform for learning, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, in this kind of um, subject, 
I think people are interested to think about their role, mm. but they're also wondering how will I do it. Yeah. Um, you know, so one of the things you talked about there was the reporting, mm. and I'm sure there's a number of our um, colleagues on the line thinking, what were the kinds of things mm. organisations were reporting on mm. that would show that they were starting to take this seriously? Yeah. 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 Can you give okay. us some examples? Yeah, so that's a good question, because when you urge people to report on something, so you should report on your progress in this area or that area, or whether it's patient safety or environmental sustainability. Even those people who are minded to do it will say, well, can you give us some idea what you think would be good? Exactly your question, mm -hmm. Carrie. And that's, that's one of the few things that we did was to establish a reporting framework. Now, we didn't invent it out of thin air. We, we looked at what was already being done by hospitals and said that these data are already available. We report on this. So, for instance, business miles travelled. Mm. Yeah, how much does a hospital spend on business miles? And then, of course, we had to correct it for how rural or how metro it was. Um, you know, where do you buy your food from? Mm. Uh, do you buy your food? A lot of hospitals buy their food they serve to patients in another country, and it's shipped overnight on big trucks, uh, triple wrapped. And that's not the best way to do it. <laughs> um, so all sorts of very interesting metrics. Uh, not only did we learn from the field, so just to make sure that the metrics and the reporting were consistent and comparable so that people had confidence that we weren't comparing apples with oranges, but we also, so for instance, for pharmaceutical waste or pharmaceutical carbon footprint, we went to global standards. So it was a mixture of what was practical on the ground that was already being done and what was authenticated as well evidence-based standards at a global level. So we had all our metrics signed off by global, a set like global reporting institute or, so we had some confidence that they had been used in other countries so that when the time comes to report, compare waste or travel or greenhouse gas emissions within the health system in the UK or Australia, we could also start comparing them in other countries with other countries. So it's a sort of combination of very local and very global. Okay. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, in, in the interim, colleagues, um, please feel free to share with us any questions you've got or just what, what are you <coughs> thinking about? What, what, is, what might this mean for you in your role and in your organisation? Um, and post some questions for David, please, as we go through this. Th the wider question for me then is also, as well as within an organisation, that conversation taking place, how many hospitals engage their communities yeah, uh, in doing yeah. this in a more connected way? Yeah, that's a great... That's a great Question, partly because when you, all of you will know, oh, everybody on, online, I'm sure, will have at one stage try to engage other people in the change or the improvement they wish to see. And that is an important process in itself, not just because it elicits ideas, because it elicits mandate. So the issue of how you engage your communities was very important to us, partly because quite a lot of the time when we, when we proposed changes, we would get kickback from people who would say, oh, no, the patients wouldn't like this, or the community wouldn't like this. And I which my response would be, well, how do we know? Have we asked them? So, for instance, when, we, when, we, when a colleague of mine in Nottingham proposed taking out fast food joints from the hospital concourse or buying local food, which would then be seasonal, he got kicked back that said, well, local people wouldn't like that. Local people won't like that happening. To which he would say, how do we know? Have we asked them? Let's ask them. So he asked them and people said, I'd be absolutely delighted to eat seasonal food. Anything would be better than the food we're getting now. <laughs> so that gave him both mandate. Um, and, and similarly, at a national level, when we started getting a little bit of kickback from people who said, um, look, wh why are you worrying about these existential issues like climate change and air quality and, and food systems? Your job is just to stay in your consulting room, stay in your hospitals, deal with the patients that come through the door. We went out three times to a public opinion survey mm -hmm. and we asked questions about, is it, is it appropriate for the health service to look at the wider determinants of health? Should we spend money on it? And should it be one of our priorities? And to all of those answers we got, over the years we've done it, over the 10 years, we've got uh, answers of in the area of 90%. And that's gone up over the years. So you absolutely have to seek the mandate of the public in this. Um, and another, just another final quick example, when people said, no, we, we can't take care closer to home because people want to be seen in the big national or city centre hospital. They don't want to be seen in smaller rural cottage hospitals. So we went out and we surveyed people and they said, We'd be absolutely delighted to be seen. But where we get seen is not the issue. In fact, I'd rather not go to the big hospital where mm. I can't park and where I get MRSA and my, visit, my relatives can't visit me. So, there are, we, we, you know, your question is really important that we just, you just need to listen. And that's not always easy, asking the right questions. And it takes time and, and resources to listen to people about what, what sort of future is it they wish to see and what processes are we, are we willing to accept now to enable that, that better future to happen. Yeah, and, and, and thinking about kind of better futures, you know, one of the one of the comments that we hear quite often in healthcare is that as organisations, environmentally, 
we're too interested in the six or eight hours a year or twice a year somebody comes into our hospitals mm. and not interested enough in the 365 days mm. that they're trying to manage and live with their own health yeah. and well-being. Yeah. And, and, a, and a, a kind of challenge, I think, for us as organisations and health systems to understand more of what that means mm. and then to design our care processes mm. to, to reflect that. Mm. It's mm. kind of similar to what I think you're saying. Of course. Yeah, sure. I, know, I mean, I mean one, of the, one of the things we've been quite successful with in terms of if, if any of you online are, have ever been involved with what is quality healthcare, you'll know that you know quality gets divided up into these certain dimensions like safety or cost effectiveness or compassion and patient centeredness or fairness or responsiveness and these are all really really important dimensions and sometimes they will compete with each other there are trade-offs but the Royal College of Physicians in London has added sustainability to that rich set of dimensions and the beauty of sustainability is it can make the system more cost effective it can make it safer it can make it more patient centered and local so it's a good example of a dimension of quality especially when you engage the wider community or the wider determinants of health that has a, can have a profound part a profound part to play in what our health service is becoming and, and I'm not underestimating the problem that is in, if you de-hospitalize healthcare there are a lot of people who will kick back we all know that mm -hmm. and and because we're challenging historical fashions or we're, we're challenging fiefdoms or empires or tribes where people have been trained in one way and then asked to be operated in another way so that it's tricky it's not easy yeah. mm -hmm. and and you know at the moment when we're all trying to think about how we can really shift the balance of care mm. from hospital mm. closer to people's homes mm. it's actually quite an interesting proposition that in doing that we could also think of how we could be more innovative around sustainability yeah, yeah. and that, that sustainability dimension won't be the priority mm. you won't i don't think i'll ever as a clinician make a decision for a patient or even a community thinking the first priority is climate change but if there's equipoise or if the if it's it's neither here nor there this is a really important dimension to take into account um, you know so if two drugs are equally costly or cheap or equally effective and have the same tolerable side effects but one is much more carbon intensive than the other or then then you, you you might you might actually take your decision but most of it most of the sustainability arguments are yet another reason for reducing pharmaceutical waste, yet another reason for having chronic disease management programs in the community, mm. another reason preventing type 2 diabetes by better diet, better physical activity, all those issues, rather than medicalizing everything and waiting until it comes to the front door of a very expensive, shiny hospital, where after all, a lot of things we do now in hospitals can now be done outside hospitals. Yeah. But we built the hospitals, we staff the hospitals, we heat light and insure the hospitals, so m might we not use the hospitals? But actually, hospitals have a quite a high turnover and you know there are plenty of places in the world where there are smaller hospitals, smarter hospitals, um, which are cheaper to run and better for the community, and incidentally, better for the environmental impact they thus have. Mm. So your, your 10 years in your experience mm. over um, in England, um, reflecting back on those 10 years, mm. would you do it any differently? Those early years, would you know what have you now learned that might cause you to do anything different in your approach? I think I would listen even more. I mean, all the successful things we've done, and all the great case studies we stumbled across, and measured, and disseminated. Um, but many of them I st we stumbled acro across fortuitously, Carrie. I think what I would have done is been much more systematic about it, and I think I would have, I think I grossly underestimated how we grossly underestimated how many people locally were up for this. Mm -hmm but were struggling to make it part of their everyday job in a busy work environment and, and align it with their responsibility to patients or their responsibility as an employee. And I think, so, so I'll give you a little example of how I would have done that better, we would have done it better. Quite often people would say, um, I've seen what they've done at that hospital, we want to do it in this hospital, we haven't got time to put a really cast iron business plan together. Could, is it possible for you as a central national unit to make default business plans with some of it filled out in terms of environmental and health benefits? Mm -hmm. so that because we can't, we haven't got the capacity to do that, mm -hmm. or even the knowledge to do that. So little things about energising very practical things locally, that would, because I suppose we were very busy changing regulations and policy nationally, and we took, we, we might be accused of taking our eye off the ball that most innovation takes place locally. Mm. And most innovation is about removing things nationally, removing outdated laws or regulations, not introducing new ones. I mean, we, we very rarely introduced a new regulation, but for instance, we often took them off the books, like, I don't know what it's like here in Australia, but in the UK, if you work for the health service, the bigger your car, the more you get paid per mile. That's stupid. That you're incentivizing big cars. Mm. And we wanted to actually tip it the other way around. We wanted to give more pence per mile to people who were driving small cars or hybrid cars or electric cars. In fact, we've got it level now, but it's certainly not skewed the wrong way around that it used to be. That's quite rare to be able to change those sort of policies, and it took a long time. And, and, but the unions were very good, and they were very on side with this. Most innovation takes place very locally, 
despite the policies, not because of policies. And you have to get those outdated policies out of the way and make it normal. Yeah, and, mm. and you raise an interesting question, I think, which is for all of us in our own roles, it would be really interesting to explore what incentives mm. people see, what mm. incentives we have in our own yeah. system yeah. Um, that actually uh, affect and influence yeah. how we do yeah. this. Yeah. And those incentives can be very perverse and very insidious and very behavioural. So if you're trying, I'll give another example, Kerry. Okay? If you're trying to, for instance, if you run a clinic and you're trying to do it in terms of make it into a telephone clinic for people who don't actually need to come, you're only giving them results, mm -hmm. um, or you're just, it's a checkup. Many hospitals will only get paid by central government or state government in the UK. Uh, they'll get paid much less for a telephone clinic. It makes more money for the hospital if you get a patient through the door. Mm -hmm. So we sort of monetize illness in a sense. So the more you do in a hospital, the more you get paid. So we're rewarding activity, and some of it not needed, and some of it actually possibly harmful in all sorts of different ways, rather than monetizing or incentivizing health outcomes defined by the patient or the public. Now, not many health systems in the world do that, mm. and it would be great if we did. <laughs> that sounds like another webcast, actually, does, David, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> altogether. Um, the, um, the, the other kind of question for me, just alongside doing it differently, is so given, given the experience you've had, mm. what today remains your biggest challenge? And well, it. yeah, there are yeah. lots of, it, th this whole business is still seen as slightly fringy. It's not yet part of core business. Um, but I think we are getting there. I mean, when I started, I started talking about low carbon patient pathways, which sounds like a piece of ghastly jargon, and indeed it is. But, and people say, what are you talking about? You know, you make yourself look stupid by trying to progress the discourse in that way. But actually a lot of people now, would, now it, 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 quite independent of any work we've done in the NHS in England, would say, well, this may be a better way to treat you know, child and adolescent mental health issues. Um, so what do the patients say? How much will it cost? What will be the environmental impact of changing it? So it started to come into the, it started to come into the conversation naturally. So, but, so the biggest challenge is, how can we make these pockets of excellence normal? Normalizing it is, and people still come up to me and say, I'm very interested in this. And I say, why are you whispering? <laughs> so giving people confidence yeah. that it's a normal part of our business in terms of health yeah. of our public or our patient. Well, not our, they're not our public or our patient. The patients and public we purport to serve. Making it normal and, and, and liberating and permissioning the health, health managers and clinicians is really important. And giving permission is the best way to absolutely. create innovation, yeah. isn't it? Proceed um, until apprehended. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we have some questions okay, coming great. through. Um, so the first one we have from Stuart is it's kind of linked in a way to what we've been saying about successes mm. um, and celebrating that. Um, what do you think have been your biggest improvements, the biggest changes that you, you and NHS England are most proud of? Yeah, I, well, in, in objectively, let, Stuart, let's split that into two things. Objectively, I think the biggest success we've had is changing the mantra of the health service to from better health and care to better health and care for all now and for future generations. Now, that is just adding on seven words. But that goes back to what we were saying earlier about it makes it normal to consider the future. And as health service people, most people in the health service are crisis junkies. We just don't do the future. With my, my, my idea of planning when I was a clinician was to reach the end of the clinic and to reach the end of the weekend tape with strategic planning. So we don't really do planning. So to allow people to look at the mantra uh, is, is, is very important. So that's, a, that's an example of a big opt. The second one is, is mandatory rep reporting, which is not a bureaucratic burden. People some, mostly are glad to be able to celebrate their success. So those are two really great objective successes that I think have happened on our watch. Subjectively, I think things like having non-executive directors, leaders um, at really senior positions, getting up and saying, this is important. So much as we talk about permissioning people at the sharp end of healthcare to take this into account, live their values, if you like, what's really inspiring is to see, equally inspiring, let's say, is to see very well-known leaders get up and say, after they're talking about patient safety or a look-back scandal or something very that the press are interested in, is to say, but before I go, there are a few other things we need to talk about, you know, population, demography, inequality, safety, climate change. So. The, the courage with which leaders will get up and say these things, even though they're not experts on them. I think that's quite an interesting form of leadership. And I think that's, that's happened a lot more in our watch too. Excellent. Um, we have another question from uh, Christine. This has got kind of two sides to it. Um, the first one is about, so how did this strategy in itself help transform health yeah. in the UK? Yeah. And linked to that, were there any measurable outcomes for patients? Yeah. <laughs> It's a pity you added four patients, and that'd be easy <laughs> if it were <laughs> Christine. <laughs> so what was the, the first one was? How, was how has this strategy and approach in itself transformed health? Yeah, in the UK? No, that, that's a great yeah. question, because I think in healthcare, we, we sort of get obsessed 
by the process of healthcare, not the outcomes for health. So it's a great question. So let me give you an example. One of the things that hospitals often do now is reduce the amount of car parking, which is hugely political. Um, but the, the reason they have to reduce car parking is because they need to build, for instance, cancer clinics or outreach clinics on limited land. And interestingly, the, the way they framed, some of them have framed it is to say, you know, we've built a bus station inside our hospital, not a car park. Okay? And the reason we've done this is for, to make it easier for everybody to get to the hospital, not just those people who have cars, and also because we're reducing our burden on air quality. And every hospital in England, Christine, is told what the burden they produce, not just on carbon emissions, but on NOx, diesel, PM10s, PM2.5s. And they can then say, we've calculated for every hospital, in doing that, we are reducing the number of exacerbations of lung disease or asthma in children, for instance. So there are direct health benefits, mainly m manifest um, through air quality improvement on patients in the community before they even get to the hospital. I know there's only one, ex one example, Christine, but just doing that sends out the message that hospitals can harm as well as help. So if you look on page nine of the Sydney Morning Herald this morning, you'll see an outline of how one reporter has detailed, I think the headline is something like, when hospitals hurt people. And so there's a good example of how hospitals can take seriously their opportunity and, if you like, duty of care to improve the health of the community even before they become patients. And certainly not making them patients. That, that's, so that's just one example. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had some comments supporting some of the conversation we've already had, David. So Desley, who works in a rural hospital, is just reflecting on how wonderful it would be if we could work together with our communities mm. to really think this through. Um, and, and, and instead of coming at this in our silos. Mm. Um, and mm. have you, in terms of your case studies, can you think of any good stories where that's really happened? Yeah, I mean, I think engaging your... It, it really depends where you think the boundaries of responsibility are of the healthcare system. And Christine's question was a good example of: Are we in the? What is the business we are in? Is it in the provision of healthcare to sick people, or is it the provision of healthcare to sick people as one way, but not the only way in which we can improve the health of the population? So I'll tell you an example of a really interesting project. Which you may think this is slightly strange, but it's the and the health service is only tangentially involved. Actually, there's, some, there's a phenomenon called guerrilla gardening, where you encourage people, sometimes who are lonely, sometimes who are retired, sometimes who've got a lot of spare time, to take small patches of unused or land of dubious ownership in a community in a town, and not only beautify it and water it and cultivate it and grow shrubs, but also grow vegetables on it, which people are and put little signs at, and people are very happy to have them picked and there are little recipes. This is a project, it's a worldwide project called Incredible Edible, which the health service is actually run by someone who was the, the chair of a hospital, um, a very senior uh, a lady in Yorkshire in England. Now, the issue is, this is the interesting thing that she explained to me, apropos your question about the community, is that this is not improving health by having people eat vegetables, okay? That is the entry point. The way it improves health is to address loneliness and people, some, so quite a lot of GPs would refer as a prescription, rather than writing antidepressants, is making a prescription of saying, look, here is free membership, or this is how to join this group. And similarly with walking clubs, it's probable, although yet to be tested, that the health benefit of family doctors or nurses prescribing walking clubs as a health intervention would be not because just because of the physical activity that they might thus undertake and increase, but by the loneliness and the social cohesion and all the other health benefits of that which will take the burden off the health service because we will have far less preventable disease in our hospitals. So there are ways in which the health service can do that. I mean, the, the biggest one actually is using a massive procurement budget to buy better. So if we had time, we could go into the difference between buying fair trade coffee, which many of us probably do, but how hospitals could buy fair trade surgical instruments around the world, which has a massive impact, which is yet a whole other story, but one really worthwhile asking your directors of procurement about because there's something for everybody in this business, and that's a particularly good example of something that people have done in, in England. It's, it's led by one person actually, an e ENT surgeon, which is wonderful. And, uh, and as with most of these innovations, you only need one person. You only need one person. Movement. And innovation usually only starts from one person, but, but, but having a unit at a state level or a federal level permissions that and catalyzes and joins up a lot of these case studies and makes it normal. And that's when it gets into governance. And mm -hmm. that's when chief execs are called to account about why are you not doing this in your hospital? Not just giving them award an award because they are doing it, but looking at all the others and saying, any reason why you're not. So that's quite a big tipping point. Okay. Um, we've got a very specific question now from um, Tina, um, who's over in Western Australia. Um, she's uh, Western Australia currently um, conducting a sustainable health review. Mm. And she's wanting to pick your brains a little bit here. Um, if you were asked to make some recommendations about how to make healthcare more environmentally sustainable and cost effective, what would you suggest? Yeah. 
So this is a very, th thanks, a great question, Tina, because this is quite, w it's important not to let the word sustainable get traduced by people who are only talking about financial sustainability. I mean, that is important. Being financial sustainability, it's incredibly important. But what most canny businesses do now, most ethical businesses, is look at their whole business model in terms of financial sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability, and what they would call social sustainability. And that's the, the, what the previous questions we're trying to address, which is what good are they doing for the community? Um, so any sensible health review which was called, had the word sustainable in it, which was only looking at financial, would be very narrow-minded. And not only narrow-minded, would, would be ignoring some of the huge win-wins. Because in health terms, financial sustainability against environmental sustainability against, let's call them health outcomes in our case, not only for patients but for public, where those overlap, Tina, are very, very big. Much bigger, actually, than all the innovation going on in the business sector. So I would, I mean, what, one of the most important things you can do is write to the review and say, my name's Tina, I work in La Dida, I'm, 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 it's great to see this review, can I help you? It's always great with reviews to, to say, can I help you? Because I'm very interested in how we make this system more financially sustainable by looking at environmental sustainability and social benefits of what we do as healthcare systems. And if it's any help to you, in, we've been going for 10 years. In year one, we saved 17 million pounds. By year three, we'd saved 300 million. At the end of 10 years, we'd saved nearly 2 billion. And we've got a little publication to show how that can be measured and done. So it's not as if you will be submitting your offer of help to that review in Western Australia as a sort of pie in the sky. There is evidence from elsewhere in the world, the US, UK, plenty of other places. But the most important thing you can do in terms of engagement, coming right back to the first question of this webinar, is to offer your help. Um, and I, I think you might find there are some receptive, receptive um, ears there. But nothing will happen if you don't sit up and offer help. Because as I always say, one person's a crank, two people is a pressure group, but three people is public opinion. So, you know, it, it does count, actually, numbers do count. So you do it, but persuade some of your colleagues to, you know, offer similar help. Thank you. We've kind of linked to that in some ways. We've got another question now about how we, um, what's the steps that we should be taking to transition to a funding model that incentivises? Yeah. So incentivises what you're describing, which is a shift to proactive mm. um, care that's modelled on optimising health and wellbeing in its widest sense and is not disease-centric. Yeah. What, what's your reflections and experience of that, David? Well, that would be wonderful if we could do that. And, and I suppose the, the, the good news is there are little green shoots of that happening. Um, if you go to Kaiser Permanente, which is mm. one example, which is a hospital system, a healthcare system in the United States in, based in California, they have a what's called a vertically integrated health system where they, they're an insurance company, but they own their hospitals. <laughs> so what they do is they have a business model where fi their financial incentive is very closely aligned with the incentive to improve health to prevent preventable diseases. So they know that when their members get sick and come into hospital, they have failed them. They fail their members in some way, because many hospital admissions, for instance, are, are preventable. In fact, some people would argue that over half of all hospital admissions are preventable. And what they will do is they will say, especially for unplanned admissions, they will say that all unplanned admissions are a serious untoward incident until proved otherwise. So they, they will treat them as system failures. So first, the first issue is to have a systems approach to it, not a sort of micromanaging um, effect where you have tribes and fiefdoms and competition. Your objective is to improve health, and your role is healthcare. But by not preventing, for instance, diabetic ketoacidosis or not preventing type 2 diabetes, you're letting down your patient, your public, your member, and you're also damaging the financial viability. because you, it's. it's you're losing, the system is losing money, and it's hugely inconvenient and unethical for the patient to ignore what's preventable. So what you've touched on in your question is, where do we align health outcomes with the business model? So you need business models which incentivize health. So you need pharmaceutical companies not to be paid for making insulin, but to be paid for making insulin and for decreasing complications in the community of diabetes. So just finally, I worked in China for a couple of years and was very lucky to observe a system whereby village doctors in, in small rural communities were paid actually by every member of the, by every family in the community while their family was well. As soon as your child or your relative in the family got ill, you were allowed to stop paying. Now, if you think about it, that incentivizes the village health worker to do everything you can to create all those conditions where you keep people healthy, yeah. which included actually, in this circumstance, helping build small bridges to, to allow women to get their vegetables to market to, in order to barter and get rice to bring back to their families. And that, that, that's really getting at the core of what it means to be healthy. But the, financially, the village health workers were incentivized to do just that. So there are these little green shoes. So ha keep asking the question of all your colleagues, because it's not, it's not, if we don't ask those questions, we won't, we'll just continue to think more is better. And more is not better. Better is better. And sometimes less is better, or smarter is better. But more is not better, necessarily. Okay. 
And just finally, before we finish, um, if colleagues on the on the webcast are now energised, excited, want to learn more, and yep. hopefully, hopefully you are, where can they go? What, what's some good publications, references, research, well, evidence? Well, yeah, so we were talking just before we started. There's the Medical Journal of Australia has just published a whole journal, a whole edition focused on this issue. Um, there is a framework in Australia for doing exactly this. Um, and many organisations of which some of you will be members, I think, you won't be able to see it from there, but if you just see there are a lot of logos there. And this is called CAHA, which is the coalition, um, uh, is it CAHA? So if you just Google CAHA, it's the um, Climate and Health Alliance for Australia. So you will, um, you'll find the names of people. You just need to realise there are people probably around you, just by virtue of all the questions we've heard, who are as interested as you might be, and who are probably doing some of these things as well. So you're not on your own. Um, look at the, f the National Framework for Australia. Um, have, learn how to have intelligent and non-threatening conversations with your colleagues about how you can bind some of these issues into your um, daily work is for you or your team or your health centre or your hospital. But most of all, I would urge you to start framing climate change as a health issue. Follow the money, but don't just focus on environmental issue, as an environmental issue. Focus on what the role you have and what your team or hospital health centre does. Because because as we've been discussing, this this is happening on our watch now. It will very much be our legacy, how we address this. It's not a, it's not a future issue, it's a now issue. Thank you, David. Um, colleagues, I'm going to bring the session to a close. We're almost at one o'clock. So thank you all for joining us in the webcast today. I'd like to also extend our thanks to David for inviting us to reflect on our responsibility for future generations, not just today. And I think he's given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I'll maybe just use this as an opportunity to remind us of um, ACHSM upcoming events. So we do have our next national live webcast on 14th of June, 11.30 a.m. And Kate Jenkins, who's the Sex Discrimination Commissioner for the Australian Human Rights Commission, is going to be talking to us then. We also have registrations that will open soon for the ACHSM Asia Pacific Health Leadership Congress, which is in Darwin from the 19th to the 21st of September this year. And state conference for New South Wales, South Australia, Queensland is in May and Western Australia in June and registrations are now open. We do like to hear feedback from yourselves and I would invite you to also um, re complete the online evaluation form when you receive it. We hope you found today's discussion, bo discussion both stimulating and interesting and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again through the webcast in June. Thank you very much. <laughs>